tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. We now return to a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee hearing on financial control boards. Members are looking at a financial control board as an option for Washington, D.C., due to the city's current financial situation. This hearing provides information on how such boards functioned in other major cities. I apologize for the uh, delay. Uh, the um, meeting will come be uh, back in session. I'd now like to yield to the distinguished representative from the uh, City of Philadelphia, uh, Mr. Fatah, to introduce the members of our final panel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, now that we've heard from the rest, uh, we will hear uh, from the best. I take uh, exception uh, in the comment of the uh, former controller from New York who said that after hearing from Governor of Ohio and uh, the former Mayor of Cleveland and from Governor Kerry himself, we had gotten the best advice that we could get uh, on this subject matter because uh, there is a uh, truly spe spectacular story of uh, a, an experience in Philadelphia. And the three gentlemen who are going to testify were uh, very much a part of that activity. Uh, and as a member of the legislature at that time in the State Senate, uh, I was able to be uh, a part, a small part of the creation of uh, a process that led to Philadelphia being uh, well positioned uh, to enter the next uh, century uh, out of debt and um, responding to its problems in its neighborhoods. I want to introduce uh, the three people who are going to be testifying here today. Dr. Um, Bernard Anderson, who is an assistant secretary at the U.S. Department of Labor, was in fact the governor's appointee to the PICA board, the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority. Uh, Note the notion of cooperation rather than control. It was indeed a cooperative process between the state government uh, and the city of Philadelphia's elected government uh, to find a way uh, through uh, a financial crisis. And Dr. Bernard Anderson was the uh, a governor's appointee and chair of the PICA board uh, that worked through that, that problem. Uh, Dave Cohen, uh, who, who is the chief of staff to America's mayor, um, Mayor Ed Randell, who has both been um, uh, congratulated and recognized for his work in a bipartisan uh, way here in the Congress for all of his hard work to uh, help lead Philadelphia and, in fact, uh, help lead the way for the rest of the country's mayors uh, on a number of critical issues. And uh, Dave Cohen is uh, considered in Philadelphia one of the co-mayors uh, because he is uh, uh, one of the uh, significant players in the administration and the council's relationship that's helped move the city forward. And Ronald Henry, who served as the, as the first uh, executive director of the PICA Authority, which you're going to hear much more about in this testimony, um, helped craft through a cooperative working arrangement between the board uh, and the city's uh, 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 key players, an arrangement uh, that has uh, returned Philadelphia's uh, financial health and fiscal house uh, to order. So I want to welcome uh, and introduce uh, these gentlemen as they come to bring uh, the Philadelphia story uh, and help this committee think through its obligations. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Fatah. Thank you very much. Uh, we're just uh, very pleased to have all of you uh, here today. I know what you say is going to be very, very important, which is why we wanted you to be here today. We appreciate you staying with us through that last uh, vote recess. And uh, Mr. Anderson, we'll start with you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to come here today and to offer to you and other members of the committee uh, the Philadelphia story with respect to the Oversight Board. And I'm uh, very happy to offer this in the presence of my good friend uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton and my good friend uh, Congressman Chaka Fatah, uh, who was very instrumental in helping us solve the problem in Philadelphia. Let me say, Mr. Chairman, that um, I have submitted for the record my statement, which I would ask be recorded as an official part of these hearings. And I also want to uh, put in a disclaimer out at the outset that um, I am speaking today as an individual expressing his own views on this matter, uh, not speaking for the administration, for the Office of Management and Budget, or for the Department of Labor. Uh, and so my views are my own on this issue, 
and uh, should be taken as such in the record of these uh, hearings. Uh, let me say that from June 1991 through December 1993, I had the great privilege to serve as uh, chairman of the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority, which we fondly call PICA. And what I'd like to do is simply describe briefly our experience, the goals, the structure, the background of PICA board members, its staff, and our operating style, because I think that is very important in understanding how an entity like this can work and how it can help a city in fiscal distress. Uh, first, uh, in a nutshell, Philadelphia's problem. Between fiscal year 1986 and 1991, Philadelphia was clearly spending more than it was receiving in revenue. Uh, the rate of spending per annum was about 5.6% uh, per year. Revenue was coming in around 3.2% per year. Uh, it was projected in fiscal 91 that if that rate of spending had continued, the accumulated deficit would have been more than $450 million by fiscal year 1996. And in fact, uh, the accumulated deficit by fiscal 92 was over $200 uh, million. Uh, in the midst of that darkening storm of fiscal travail, it was very clear that the mayor and the city council were unable to come up with a plan to attack the structural deficit and to put in place those measures that were necessary to get spending under control. Uh, in fact, the disagreement between the mayor and the city council was compounded also by the disagreement between the city officials and state officials on a wide variety of issues, not the least of which was the state contribution to the city for certain uh, human service expenditures and the court costs and other expenditures of that type. And I think that um, the result was that Without a plan in place to address the city's worsening fiscal crisis, the bond markets um, lost confidence in the city of Philadelphia, and in late 1990, uh, the city lost its investment grade rating on the bond. Uh, that then spurred the state into action, which by statute created um, uh, PICA, and I think the rationale that was presented was that the threat of a fiscal emergency would lead to the interruption of essential public services that would threaten the public health and safety, not only of uh, the people of Philadelphia, but um, also the other people in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so the board was created to do essentially two things. One was to help the city regain access to capital markets, and the other was to foster sound financial planning and budgetary practices to get the city out of the position it was in at that time. Let me very quickly say something about the board, because this might be of some interest to you as you contemplate an entity for the District of Columbia. The PICA board includes seven individuals. Five of them are voting members of the board, all of whom are of private citizens. The five voting members of the board are selected by the governor, are appointed by the governor and by the minority and majority leaders of the State House and Senate. There are two additional public members of the board. One is the finance director of the City of Philadelphia. The other is the secretary of the budget for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Let me tell you who the five voting members were. One was the head of a local science museum who was also a venture capitalist. Another, uh, a young woman, was a, a small business person who owns a computer, personal computer services company which provides training for people to learn how to operate computers. A third member of the board, another woman, was a partner of one of the city's leading law firms. The fourth member of the board was a uh, stockbroker who had previously served earlier in his life as the 
chairman of the Philadelphia uh, Stock Exchange. And the, fourth, the fifth voting member of the board was your humble servant, who formerly served as a tenured faculty member at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, none of the five uh, voting members of the board were active in politics at the time they were selected, but uh, one member of the board had previously been a candidate for the uh, mayorship of uh, the city of Philadelphia. I would say that the term of office for members of the board is coterminous with their appointing authority, which of course varies depending upon the election uh, cycle. Uh, the members of the board were not compensated for their services. Let me emphasize that. Uh, we never received a dime for the numerous hours that we spent uh, in assisting in dealing with this problem. In fact, I had recently organized a small consulting firm myself, but at the time I was appointed chairman of uh, the PICA board, I was spending over 60 percent of my time in a non-compensated effort. Let me say that the chairman of the board is elected by the board, not appointed chairman. However, in the tradition of Pennsylvania authorities, usually the person who is appointed by the governor is elected chairman, and that was the reason I was elected chairman of, of, of the PICA board. Um, we had a professional staff that uh, included four professionals and two support staff. Uh, Ron Henry, whom you will hear from um, in just a minute, was the executive director of that uh, staff. The staff, obviously, I is paid. However, in selecting members of the board, the requirement was that individuals be persons with a background either in finance or economics or and management that they either be residents of the city of Philadelphia or they have their principal business or employment in the city of Philadelphia. And so there were several members of the board who were not residents of the city of Philadelphia, but they all had an economic stake in the city of Philadelphia. We were authorized to provide uh, public assist uh, assistance to the city of Philadelphia to deal with its financial problems. <laughs> But in the formation of the statute creating PICA, there were two things required before we could offer any financial assistance to, PICA, to, to the city of Philadelphia. One was that we had to agree to an intergovernmental cooperation agreement with the city of Philadelphia. The IGA describes the requirements and standards for the preparation, approval, and monitoring of the financial plan the terms and condition, conditions for the issuance of bonds and the establishment and management of a city account, which is the account into which certain tax funds and bond proceeds would be, would be placed. The five-year financial plan was designed to offer a balanced budget in each of the five years and the establishment of certain measures that would eliminate the structural deficit in the city's uh, accounts. The board was authorized to review and approve the financial plan after it was adopted both by the mayor and by the uh, city council. Uh, we received quarterly reports and uh, we would have to review those quarterly reports on the city's progress in living up to the terms of the financial plan. What I think is also important here to get some sense of how the influence was exercised is that in any quarterly report in which there was a variance in the city's uh, meeting of the, the, the balanced budget with respect to revenue and spending, we would publicly pronounced that a variance existed, the city would then be required to submit monthly reports to the board, and the mayor then would be informed that uh, he had uh, 30 days to come up with a plan to balance the budget in the future, that is, in the next quarterly report or the quarterly report after that. If over a period of 30 days, I believe, 
The variance which was established in or, or identified in a quarterly report was not corrected. Then the board had the obligation to inform the state of this development. And we had the authority to withhold tax revenues, state funds, certain state funds, and bond proceeds from the city of Philadelphia until such time as the variance was corrected. And so that was sort of the, the stick that we had to encourage a compliance with the five-year financial plan. Let me say that our operating philosophy was one of cooperation and not control. The very first press conference that I had after being appointed to the board, I made a public statement that in my view, we did not intend to control the city of Philadelphia. It, the city of Philadelphia has elected officials who were put in place by the taxpayers of that community. <laughs> and that what we wanted to do would be to be of assistance to the elected officials in coming up with ways to address the city's fiscal crisis. And that is the way we operated. Uh, we engaged in a close examination of the accuracy of financial data submitted to us by the city the assumptions of revenue and spending which appeared in the financial plan. I can report to you that over the period that um, I was chairman of PICA, every vote we had was a unanimous vote on every critical issue. There was not uh, a public uh, disagreement among members of the board over what we had to do. Now, that does not mean that we did not have vigorous debate among ourselves out of the uh, glare of uh, the public light over how we should come down on the quarterly reports and the review of what we were doing. But we were able to reach a consensus among ourselves so that on every major issue, we had a, a unanimous vote. And I would also add that it was critical that we work very closely with the mayor and the members of his staff, with the city council, while preserving the independence of the oversight board. There were numerous meetings with uh, senior uh, city officials in an effort to understand what was going to be in the financial plan, uh, what the city's plans were for meeting its financial needs, what the size of a bond issue should be, and other matters that we would have to ultimately uh, act on. And I want to emphasize that we worked very closely with the city's elected officials in attempting to resolve these questions. I think that the PICA experience in Philadelphia was a success. The city is now on the way to solving its uh, fiscal problems. Uh, great progress has been made since 1992. Uh, but uh, there are many challenges that remain, and I might add here that one of the things that is necessary to really s achieve a long-term solution to this problem is sustained economic growth in the city of Philadelphia. I was chatting with uh, David Cohen earlier and asking him uh, how employment was growing. And uh, I was, because since I came to Washington, I haven't kept up as closely with this as I might otherwise do. And unemployment is still high in the city of Philadelphia. Employment is not growing uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, there is still a serious problem of poverty and demand for social services. These are the necessities that make it uh, require uh, city expenditures for various purposes because um, there are no funds to meet these needs of significant level other than through general revenues of, of the city. Uh, I might mention that 48 percent of the city's revenue is uh, based on the uh, wage tax. And uh, the wage tax is applied both to city residents and to persons who work in the city but live in, in, other, in other places. Um, I would say that part of the reason we were successful is that an oversight board of the type we were associated with gives elected officials the political cover they need to make unpopular choices. 
uh, and to control spending. In other words, the oversight board, in effect, is a heat shield. Uh, the mayor, members of city council can make decisions on spending and blame it on the board because they don't have any choice in the matter. And this can be a very useful device for allowing the city to reduce payrolls, to eliminate services, to restructure government, to introduce new management techniques, to renegotiate labor contracts, and do all of the other things that are necessary. And I would say in closing that um, I don't believe that we could have achieved success in this venture had we not received the full support and cooperation of Mayor Rendell and the President and members of uh, City Council. Uh, our objective was to see that the City put in place uh, financial planning systems and the management systems necessary to control spending. And that was done. It was a very difficult task, uh, but uh, the City was able to use this institutional device as a framework within which to do many of the things that I think elected officials knew they had to do in order to restore the, system, the, the city's fiscal uh, solvency. I'll stop there, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that members of the committee might have. Thank you. I think we'll go here, ahead and hear from Mr. Cohen at this point. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members of the committee. Um, thank you, Congressman Fatah, for, for, that, uh, for that introduction. I must say it is a pleasure to testify before Congressman Fatah in this body, having previously testified before him in the Pennsylvania State Senate, and I don't know where the next place I'll get to testify in front of you will be. Um, what I would like to do um, in, in, an op in a brief opening statement is to give some of the highlights of the Philadelphia story, not, not uh, to brag as to what Philadelphia has accomplished, but rather to give you a sense as you confront the District of Columbia's problems that these problems are not unique, that they um, are not unlike those that were faced by the City of Philadelphia only three short years ago, um, and that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and that that light is not the headlight of an onrushing locomotive, but it is the light of a, of a potential solution to these problems. And then to give you some specific comments on Philadelphia's Oversight Board, uh, which Dr. Anderson has, has so ably uh, described, the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority. Um, if we can turn the calendar back three years ago to 1992, um, Philadelphia at that point, at the time when Ed Rendell was sworn in his office and John Street, who is the President of City Council, was elected to that position, um, the city uh, confronted a $200 million cumulative deficit um, that was projected to grow about $250 to $300 million a year um, over, the, over the ongoing years um, unless corrective action was taken. Um, that annual structural deficit was about 10 to 12 percent of the city of Philadelphia's operating budget. And the total projected deficit at the end of fiscal year 96 what that is in June 30th, 1996, would have been about $1.4 billion, uh, which at, at that point would have represented about 50 percent of Philadelphia's operating budget. Um, the city's credit ratings were at junk bond status. Um, there would have been no access at all to the long-term credit markets for about 18 months, and it was only through uh, what I guess could be charitably described as creative and unbelievably expensive financing gimmickry that the city had been able to access short-term credit markets to make cash flow borrowings in order to meet its payroll um, during the periods of the year when our real estate taxes and business taxes were not coming in. Um, all four municipal union contracts were expiring, um, all four on June 30th, 1992. And, ad and in addition to that, our public transit agency contract was expiring in March, and the school teacher's contract was expiring at the end of August. Um, when you think of all that, you might wonder why in the world would anyone have wanted to walk in that door, and some of us are still wondering about that. Um, the bottom line, I think, was provided by City and State Magazine, which called Philadelphia the municipality that sets the standard for fiscal distress in the 1990s. Um, and, and in 1992, there was no truer statement that could have been made. And as Dr. Anderson said, the, the, the pressure to 
to negotiate an intergovernmental cooperation agreement to prepare a five-year financial plan that projected balanced budgets in each of the five years. We had to have a zero uh, we had to have a zero fund balance in each of the five, zero fund balance or better in each of the five years of that initial five-year plan in order to enable PICA to do a borrowing for the city that would fund that $250 million cumulative deficit. So we were in a position where, in answer to one of the questions that was asked to Governor Kerry, where all those changes had to be made essentially over a period of six months. Um, there was no luxury of time to be afforded to the City of Philadelphia as a result of that structure. Now, in, in 1995, we are a long way from 1992 in a number of respects. The City of Philadelphia has just completed running two fiscal years with small budget surpluses, and it is the first time we have had two consecutive budget surpluses in the City of Philadelphia since the early 1980s. Um, the answer as to how we did that is enormously complicated. Um, I have provided to the committee a copy of the City's current five-year financial plan, which recites some of this history and which, in a sense, um, gives you a sense of the types of things that a City can do um, in order to deal with a financial crisis that virtually all major urban areas face today. Um, some of the issues that are included there, and I'll summarize them quickly, um, is a total of almost $800 million in what we call gap-closing initiatives that have been successfully adopted since 1992. They are efficiencies, better revenue collections, um, no tax increases, no dramatic cuts in services, no across-the-board layoffs, none of, the, none of the draconian things, frankly, that you've heard about in some other cities, because a lot of that had been done before 1992. Dr. Anderson and I were talking about the fact that in the five years before Ed Rendell was elected mayor, the City of Philadelphia was downsized from an employee workforce of about 30,000 to an employee workforce of 25,000. So there had been a substantial reduction in workforce before the financial crisis hit, and, uh, and there was a lot of consternation about just how it was that Philadelphia was going to save all this money, given that the workforce had already been winnowed out through an early retirement program, through layoffs, through attrition, through hiring freezes, through cutbacks in services, through closure of the city's only, ho only publicly owned hospital, through increases in tuition at the community college. O all the things that you hear about were all pre-1992 actions taken by the city of Philadelphia and were actions that were therefore not really available to us as we, as we approached our fiscal crisis in 1992. Um, our, I think the guts of our plan was a collection of about 250 individual management and productivity initiatives, some of them saving as little as $10,000 a year, many of them saving millions of dollars a year, developed in cooperation with PICA, in cooperation with City Council, in cooperation with the Management and Productivity Task Force, which was staffed by um, over, by over 100 corporations in the Delaware Valley that participated in a partnership with the city in figuring out how it is that we were going to get our budget contr under control and bring expenditures in line with revenues. Some of, those, some of the highlights of that include lease renegotiations, better tax collections, consolidation of the telephone system, numerous utility savings, um, computerization that resulted in, the, in, the redu in further reductions of personnel, and really literally a series of hundreds of these, of, of these types of initiatives that reshaped and, re and, and, and reformatted the way the City of Philadelphia government does business. Um, we also adopted a contracting out program, uh, not an easy situation in the City of Philadelphia, which is such a strong union city in and of itself. Um, it is a program that has affected 28 city services directly. 26 of those services have been contracted out. Um, two of them, the unions, have won the competitions that we have run. And the total sa annual savings to the city are now running in excess of $30 million a year as a result of that competitive contracting program. Mayor Rendell is fond of, was fond of saying in the campaign and has tried to say in the past three years 
that we call this competitive contracting and not privatization, as other cities have called it, because the goal is not to privatize anything. The goal is to inject competition into the delivery of city services to improve the quality of the services being delivered and to drive down the cost. And if you inject competition, it doesn't make any difference whether you privatize the service or you don't privatize the service. And in fact, the service that has the largest single savings of all 28 of those initiatives is a competition that was won by the union workforce involving the sludge disposal, sludge processing facility in our water department. Um, that, is a, that is an operation that was costing $24 million a year to run. You can look in our budget and you can see we were spending $24 million a year in fiscal year 92 and fiscal year 93. We brought in a consultant to design an RFP and to see what we could do if we would competitively contract out that initiative. Um, and the consultant concluded that if we had that work done by a private contractor, that work could be done at $16 million a year. The union came to us and said, if we can do this work for $16 million a year, will you pull the RFP? And we said yes, and they agreed to reductions in workforce, they agreed to changes in work rules, and in the 94 budget, and the 95 budget, and the 96 budget, that plant is spending, we are spending $16 million a year to run that plant with a city unionized workforce, savings of $8 million a year. Um, last and not least significant, but also not most significant, is that we negotiated tough but fair labor contracts with our municipal unions. Those contracts are saving us in excess of $100 million a year. The bulk of those savings are in the health care area um, because we negotiated a complete restructuring of our health care plans with our unions, but we also have savings as a result of disability reform, as a result of changes in work rules. There have been more than 150 changes in work rules in the way that our municipal workforce is organized um, to, do, to do business, whether it's scheduling, job classifications, or work rules such as the fact that a custodial worker um, under the old practice was not permitted to clean walls above the shoulder level. Um, if they were cleaning walls above the shoulder level, you had to be a wall washer. And wall washers made more than custodial workers. And in, the, in that 5,000 person attrition that I discussed, all the wall washers attrited out of the workforce. There hadn't been any hired, which meant that there were no walls being cleaned in city buildings above shoulder level for about five years. Not a very logical way to approach um, doing, not a very logical way to approach doing custodial services in any business, um, let alone in a government. Um, overall, as I said, over a three-year period, over $800 million of gap-closing initiatives successfully adopted, which has resulted in those two balanced budgets that I, that I talked about. All of that together has enabled the mayor this year, and we are, by the way, in the midst of our budget process now, um, had to propose a fiscal year 96 budget that includes the city's first tax cuts since 1945, first tax cuts in 50 years for the city of Philadelphia, and also includes significant enhancements of services um, in such things as the library system, the recreation department, um, the, free, the, the Fairmount Park system, the police department, and the fire department. Um, I would suggest probably the most critical departments from a citizen service delivery, um, from a citizen service delivery perspective. Um, what are the lessons that we can take from the Philadelphia experience? First, and I think foremost, you need the political will to accomplish difficult things. Nothing that has been explained to you by any of the witnesses earlier in the day, nothing that I've just outlined for you was easy. Um, I think we have been fortunate in Philadelphia, uh, the way that our press has described this is that we didn't bludgeon anyone, we didn't cut anyone's aorta, we just nicked a thousand people in different places. So everyone was walking around the city with paper cuts instead of gaping wounds. But when you nick everyone with paper cuts, they still come down to the mayor's office and demonstrate. And the mayor loves to tell the story <laughs> of a phone call that he received from a very good friend and a, and, a, and a significant contributor who was apologizing to the mayor saying that he had to be part of a group that was going to come down to City Hall the next day and demonstrate in front of his office. And he just wanted the mayor to understand that. 
And the mayor said, Jim, hold on a second, if you don't mind, and let me check something for you. And he said, okay, sure, and put him on hold and just kept him on hold for 30 seconds, then picked up the phone and said, it's fine. He says, you can come down. I just had to check the book because we have so many demonstrators coming here. I wanted to make sure you weren't going to be butted out of the limelight because of other demonstrators that might be held, other demonstrations that might be held outside of my office. And you have to have that attitude. You have to, be, you have to accept that if you're going to do these things, that for a year you can't leave or go into your office without being heckled or bothered by somebody who is complaining about what it is that you have done. And both the mayor, the president of city council, and the members of city council stood up to that political will and had the political will to stand up to do what was necessary in the city of Philadelphia. Second, and Congressman Fatah knows this very well, you need some level of cooperation from, in Philadelphia's case, the state government, and I will suggest that in the District of Columbia's case, the federal government. We made a very big deal over the fact, and we continue to make the big deal over the fact that we have never asked anyone for a bailout. We never asked the state to pay that $250 million deficit. When PICA borrowed $475 million on behalf of the City of Philadelphia in 1992, it's the City of Philadelphia that's going to pay every nickel of that borrowing back. And in fact, today, we pay $54 million a year to pay off the deficit reduction bonds that PICA issued in 1992. So if you want to, I mean, when people talked earlier about the fact that spending excesses and digging that hole becomes a mortgaging of the future that future generations will have to pay off, in the city of Philadelphia, we can quantify what the mortgaging of the future was done over the half decade preceding 1992. It's $54 million dollars a year, which is almost 3 percent of our operating budget over a 10-year period in order, to, in order to pay off that cumulative deficit that had, that had developed. Mm -hmm. By the same token, we did ask the state to step to the plate and pay its fair share of the services that it was supposed to pay for. And in Philadelphia's case, as Congressman Fatah remembers, that was Children and Youth Services, an area that, that was the state's responsibility and that historically had been underfunded and neglected by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, and the state did step to the plate and do that under the leadership of the Philadelphia delegation of the legislature um, and did provide the funding for that. Now, we'd also like them to pay for court costs and other things that they should pay for, and we're work we continue to work on that, but we have accomplished what we have without that. Can I just interrupt you for a second? I want to hear this, and, and I've got some questions. I need to write down. Mr. Fatan, I need to get over to vote very okay. quickly. If you could bear with us for about 15 minutes. That's I could fine. recess, and then you can uh, summarize, That's and then fine. we'll go on. I, I appreciate you bearing with us, and we'll be right back and right. declare recess. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you bearing with us. Uh, it was all, it was all to no avail. We we missed the vote by one minute, but we paired off, so it was okay. We're covered. <laughs> but this was this is great testimony. I mean that. So we wanted to give you a chance to finish. I've got a b bunch of questions. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks. Uh, where where I was was to 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 point out what I think are the two the three key lessons for, from Philadelphia's story. The first is the political will of the mayor and council. The second was the level of cooperation that we received from the state government, again, not to bail us out, but to, but to pay its fair share. And the third is the importance of PICA as an oversight board in that process, and the importance of that board simply cannot be overstated or overestimated. 
Um, Dr. Anderson has described the way in which the PICA board was structured and functioned, and I would just note the, the following things that I think were keys to the success of PICA and PICA's relationship with the city. The first, that it was a non-political, expert, interested board, um, because uh, I'm not surprised to hear that Dr. Anderson was spending 60 percent of his time working on PICA, because I know all the evening meetings we had and weekend meetings we had and 6.30 a.m. meetings we had um, to be able to, to air these issues and to discuss them. And at virtually all of these meetings, all members of the PICA board and as well as Mr. Henry as the executive director were present. And in the, in the absence of that type of a, of a committed and interested board, we could not have had the successes that we had. The second, a relatively small board. Um, and I'm not saying that five or seven members is the right size, but um, if you, I will tell you that if you get to 15, you're in deep trouble. Um, you, you need as small a board as you can put together um, to, to deal with the constituencies that you need to deal with in order to make the, make the board work as part of that process. Um, the third was a highly professional and expert staff, um, and, a, and a staff that, wa that was truly interested in working with the board and with the city in figuring out a way to solve the problems and not in making headlines itself as being the architects of solving um, the, the fiscal problems of a, of a particular city. Um, and and I, I've, I've known Ron Henry for a long time, so uh, he and I practiced in the same law firm before we, before we went our, we went slightly separate ways. And as he pointed out to me right before he took this job, this, and I took my job, he said, this is great, I'll get to be your banker. Um, and he, w he was my friendly banker. It was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a very important relationship to have a staff that knew what it was doing and knew the limits of, of its power and the authority of the PICA board and did not tread over those lines. The third, the fourth item is a cooperative relationship with the city, and, uh, and I think that should be coupled with the fifth item, is in de which is independence from the city. And there is a difference between being cooperative and just being a captive of the city process and being cooperative in terms of being constructive but still maintaining independence and not hesitating to criticize or to comment publicly on areas of disagreement that might exist between the city and the PICA board. And for credibility on Wall Street um, and for credibility of the ultimate turnaround of the city, you needed both the cooperative side, the collaborative side, as well as the independent so that uh, the outside world would know that there was, that would know that the board was independent and was prepared to blow the whistle when it was necessary to blow the whistle. Um, the sixth item I would say is, and I, I have a bias on this, I mean, I am, I am a city employee and a city official, but I think the, the, the role that Dr. Anderson described on at least a half a dozen occasions in his testimony, uh, the emphasis on the word oversight as opposed to control was a critical element of the success in Philadelphia. Um, I don't think you can impose the political will or the solution on the independent elected officials of any particular government. I think you can structure the kind of a relationship that existed in the city of Philadelphia um, without putting the decision-making authority in the hands of the outside oversight board, but putting the weapons and the bully pulpit and the power of the bully pulpit in the, ha pulpit in the hands of that board to make to be able to move the elected officials to making the appropriate decisions that they are supposed to make. And I guess I feel very strongly that that's what the officials were elected to do. Um, it should be their job ultimately to make decisions. I am a strong believer in the importance of home rule and in the importance of local officials making their own decisions. I understand that when you get, when, you, when that power is abused and you get into a situation where you need an oversight board, that there are certain restrictions and limitations, but I think the oversight structure that we used in Philadelphia is much preferable to a control structure where, where Bernie Anderson and Ron Henry, um, and as much respect as I have for the two of them, um, I think it was our system was better where you had Ed Rendell, John Street, and 16 other elected members of city council making the decisions under the, under the oversight 
um, of a PICA board as opposed to Bernie Anderson and Ron Henry making the decisions and the elected mayor and city council sitting on the sidelines. So I feel, feel quite strongly about that. Um, the, the next two, my last two items um, are also linked, and that is the possession, the, the, the oversight board needs to hold a nuclear weapon to ultimately get its way, and they have to have the willingness to use the nuclear weapon. Um, in Philadelphia's case, the nuclear weapon was the ability, as Dr. Anderson described, to inform the state that the city um, was at variance with its plan, had not submitted an acceptable corrective action, and that therefore the state should withhold all or virtually all grant revenues and support from the city of Philadelphia. Um, we could not function for very many days in the absence, in the cutoff of state revenues. And as a result, it was a nuclear weapon. Um, and, the, and I think the PICA board made quite clear um, in its, in the, from the day of its formation that although it, wanted, it did not want to use that weapon, that it would not hesitate to do so if it needed to in order to ensure compliance of the city with the statutory framework that resulted in its creation. So in summary, I believe that without all of these elements, um, the Philadelphia success story would not be present. Without, po without political will and leadership from the elected officials of the city, um, without support from the state government, and without the, without the rational intervention and cooperative intervention by an independent oversight board created under state legislation, um, I would not be able to be here today talking about Philadelphia as a success story, but instead would probably be appearing in front of the state legislature and the federal government trying to figure out some way for a bailout for this city. Um, and I'm very pleased that I don't have to do that because I personally don't think I would have very much chance of success, so it's a lot easier to talk about what we've been able to accomplish uh, with, the, with the help of the PICA process. Thank you very much. Mr. Cohen, thank you very much. That was a, a great testimony. Uh, Mr. Henry, thank, thank you, Mr. you for Chair. bearing with us. I, I always wanted to be the anchor man on a relay team like this one. <laughs> uh, in July of 1994, I testified before the previous House District of Columbia Committee, and I've left a copy of that testimony with the stenographer for inclusion in the record. I noted at that time, in most cases of fiscal distress, matters have to become undeniably bad for a critical mass of either the public or elected officials to acknowledge that something is wrong. I also said that the most critical obstacle to achievement of a long-term solution is the ability of the District of Columbia to receive additional financing from the U.S. Treasury without the imposition of stringent conditions or performance standards. Both observations are still true today. It appears notwithstanding the truly dire situation in which the district government finds itself, that most of its elected officials have not reached the point where they acknowledge the full impact of getting to the undeniably bad stage, or that there are no other viable alternatives to a control board with real power over the operations of the district government. With that as a context, it is sad to say that it is likely that matters will get somewhat worse before they can get at all better. There have been discussions about the nature of the structure that Congress inevitably will put in place whether you will follow the New York model that we heard about today, the Philadelphia model, which we've just discussed, or even the Chelsea, Massachusetts model, which is a complete receivership. I would suggest that discussions of structure beg some of the questions that should really underlie your consideration of the legislation. The first question which comes to mind is, what responsibility are you prepared to have the new agency assume under your sponsorship? Practically speaking, it is not difficult to confer authority, but the acceptance of responsibility for the exercise of those powers is another matter entirely. The issue that sits squarely on the federal government's plate as the appointing authority is whether you, as their sponsors, will be willing to give the appointees the substance of the authority that the law will ostensibly grant. That means that you should resist the urge to micromanage from here unless that amount of intervention from Capitol Hill is an explicit understanding on the way in. I would suggest, however, that the more you get in, the more you will be in, and the more visible the wisdom of your decisions will be. You should ask, does the solution fit Washington's problems and its opportunities? Unsuccessful generals fight the last war 
rather than the one they have before them today. The situation here is unique, made particularly so by the relationship which the district has with the federal government and its neighbors. What has worked elsewhere may not work in this case. In Philadelphia, as David mentioned, we had a new mayor with a very broad base of public support who was unattached to a generally agreed upon crisis. And we had all of the major labor contracts coming up within months of his ascension to office. That's not the case here. And your actions and reactions have to recognize that there are critical differences. There's little question that the federal district relationship will be reformulated as a result of the fiscal crisis and your reaction to it. If you, as a matter of policy, do not intend something to be on the table as a candidate for change, make those rules clear at the beginning. You should ask, what are the most important things to accomplish after the district does not run out of cash? The focus on the district has been on the cash crisis, and although I don't want to minimize its importance, it is likely that a device can be put in place in fairly short order to address immediate liquidity demands. There is a risk, however, that after a funding device is created, there will be such a sigh of relief from Wall Street to M Street that the consensus around the immediacy of the issue will dissipate. Issues, as we know, have a habit of coming to a boil and then evaporating. The real task is to figure out what to do next, how to keep things from continuing to get worse and to begin to slow the rate of descent. Making things better is at least one step beyond that point. What critical first choices have to be made and who are the architects and the custodians of the long-term plan? The visible task, and perhaps the most critical one, is to articulate the challenges which lie ahead, keep the problem in public view, and use the funding as a means to buy time towards addressing the larger and the more difficult items on the agenda. Therefore, a logical question from the beginning is, looking ahead, what are the long-term goals of this effort? Everyone knows that the first challenge for the new agency will, to keep, will be to keep the bus from hurtling over the cliff, to make sure that bills get paid, that the district meets its financial obligations as soon as possible. That said, what do you see down the road two, five, ten years from now? I would not even guess to attempt to set those goals for you, but urge you to set a standard that will permit the Congress, the citizens of the district, and the citizens of the nation to judge whether the war has been won or lost. It will be the standard for you to apply to decide what you should do next and when. It will begin the painful process of making people responsible for their decisions. The next questions which flow from that point are what are the most critical things that you need to have done tomorrow and don't have a prayer to accomplish even within the next two years? How then do you get along without them? Everyone has their own stories about how bad some part of the district government is. And even if a relatively small percentage of them is true, you have a huge problem to deal with. Sad to say, most of those problems aren't going to be fixed today, tomorrow, or even by the time the baseball strike is over. It could be that long. Institutionalization of fundamental change is the single most difficult and frustrating part of the effort upon which you are about to embark. But it can also be the most rewarding. You can be very sure that there are people within the district government who give the taxpayers a day's work for a day's pay and labor under extraordinarily difficult decisions. You can also be sure that there are those who will decide their future relationship with the District of Columbia, residential, educational, financial, and commercial, on the basis of what they believe the structure you put in place will be able to do. Please remember that there are hundreds of thousands of people who have done nothing to cause this cataclysm. They want only to make a decent living, educate their children, and live in a safe and stable community with reliable sources, services. As dysfunctional as the current system is, it is all they have. It will be immensely difficult to turn the district government around, even if, or perhaps especially, things go well, there would be bruised egos and shattered power bases strewn around the landscape. You have, however, no alternatives. You know that things have indeed become undeniably bad, and I wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. I'm going to just ask a few questions. Um, let me uh, start uh, 
Mr. Anderson first from your testimony, and then I'll, if either uh, uh, of our um, uh, other testifiers want to say anything, I'd be happy to hear your comments. How would the PICA board have worked uh, if you'd had an obstinate uh, mayor and council? It worked because it was cooperative. Uh, everyone recognized the problem and rose to the occasion. I'm not saying there weren't some some differences, but w what you have to write this legislation in a way that you have to assume the worst. You hope it doesn't happen. It probably won't happen. You had that. Uh, that, that bomb back there that you, in, in that case. Is that what made it work? Or what would have happened if, if everyone decided they just wanted to uh, continue to um, uh, be obstinate about things? I think that if the mayor and the leaders of city council were determined not to cooperate with the board, we would have long delayed our ability to address the problem. For example, in order for the board to do its work, we need information on the city's finances, on the tax revenue that is receiving, on its plans for expenditure levels, other kinds of information that we would not be able to obtain if we didn't get it from the city government. We, we simply need that. Uh, one of the issues, for example, that came up in our negotiation of an intergovernmental cooperation agreement was what the role of the PICA board would be with respect to labor management agreements. Uh, we did not have, as they had in New York, the authority to uh, approve labor management agreements, and we did not want that authority. However, we did want to be informed about any agreement or recommendations that the mayor would make in negotiations in order to determine in advance what the impact of that agreement would be on the city's ability to balance the budget. And so we negotiated a clause in the ICA specifying that through the negotiations, when the mayor reached the point where he was making his final offer uh, and, and they were about to agree on the terms and conditions, that we would be informed about that. Uh, that was an issue on which the unions of the city disagreed. They expressed that disagreement to members of city council. They sued us. That case went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And the city council, in an 11th hour action on, it, it literally, 11 o'clock on one Saturday night, voted against the intergovernmental cooperation agreement. On Sunday, I made a statement in response to a call from a reporter indicating that we would not accept that. That is, the board would need to have an intergovernmental cooperation agreement that provided for us the information we needed to do our job. And until that was done, we simply would not go along with it. Now, we had an election coming up. And uh, members of the city council who were running for re-election said, in effect, and one is a long-time Republican member of the city council, I, I'll, I'll mention him, Thatcher Longstrap, whom I had known for many years. He's a grand old man. Of, he's not so old. I mean, but, what, what is he? Is he 73 now? He's in his 70s. But that, he's that's a young guy around guy here. guy of yeah. the Republican Party in Philadelphia. Great, he's a great guy, really. He's a wonderful man. Thatcher said, look, you're crazy. He said, no member of city council is going to buck the unions and, and, and vote for this uh, with an election coming up. And they didn't. So this was in, um, in October. In October, there was a period of time when we could do nothing. We were absolutely unable to move forward with that agreement until after the election. When the election ended, then the city council came by back two weeks later and put the clause in and uh, agreed to it, and the intergovernmental cooperation agreement went forward. So what I'm saying is that when you have resistance, it means that it becomes far more difficult to get the information that the board needs to do its job. And uh, let me mention something else. Um, when we went into office in uh, June of 1991, at the very first meeting we had with um, the city, we were asked 
to extend to Philadelphia a short-term loan to help them through a cash crisis. Instead of them uh, issuing a tax anticipation note and paying usurious rates of interest on it, they wanted us to come in and use our authority, despite the fact that the statute mentioned very clearly that we had to have an intergovernmental cooperation agreement and a five-year plan. There was a period of time, I, I should say, when we could have extended financial assistance to the city without a plan and without an agreement in place, a very short window of opportunity. We took the position that we should not do that for the reasons that Ron Henry referred to in part of his testimony, because once you extend the money without having the agreement in place, without having the plan in place, then the heat is off. So we said, no, we want the five-year plan before we will extend any financial assistance. That spurred the city then to start working on developing the plan, rather than asking us for our assistance in extending money to deal with the short-term financial crisis. So th to answer your question, without cooperation, it makes the job very difficult. It makes the, a, there, there's a pulling and a hauling and an arguing and in court suits and all the rest about our authority versus the city's authority, and you can't do the job. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> but that, I guess, goes back to the question: you need to have good board members that will force those issues too, and on, on the on the control board. Oh, absolutely. You need board members who are absolutely fearless. Um, Listen, I, the mayor was a friend of mine. We were in high school together, Wilson Good. And uh, incidentally, he never met with the board. Uh, I met with him over dinner. And we came to a meeting of the minds about this. And I said, Wilson, we're here. You might not want us here, but we're here. And you are there. I respect your position as the mayor of the city of Philadelphia. You have got to respect our position. And I never spoke of me as an individual, but the board itself. You have got to respect what we have to do and that the people of Philadelphia can reasonably, should reasonably expect you and this board to work together. And I think it had a salutary effect. And no, no mayor wants to operate under these restrictions. But when they know that it is in their interest as well as in the interest of the people of their city, they can do it. The, uh, the makeup of your board was different than New York's and, and Cleveland's to hear the testimony earlier uh, today. Uh, you had no labor union leaders per se on the board. No. Uh, and you had the elected officials were not uh, there per se. You had a couple, uh, I guess the finance director was there for the uh, city, but that's yeah. a, a little bit different. And also the, the uh, budget state. director for the state. The state. Were they voting members? They were not voting members. There were five. The, the, the only voting members were the five private sector members. And what kind of access did the mayor and council have in the decision-making process? As you were making decisions, did they were they able to get their two cents across to you? Oh yes, so there, there was extensive communication between the, the board, the staff of the uh, of the board, and and the city government. We were in communication every day. So we they were at no, the table. We had no secrets. They were at the table, but they weren't able to, to vote. To, would that have helped or hurt to have had the mayor on the uh, Please. Mr. Chairman, the, the model here, and, th and this is a very important distinction, I think, because the model here is that the, that the decisions were really being made by the mayor and to a, and to a lesser extent by the city council. That is, and, that, and what was the, the PICA board, and I, we had these, I can't tell you how many times we had these discussions, and Dr. Anderson, if you did a, if you did a, um, a, a nexus search of newspaper clippings with his name, you would find this sentence ten times, which is, it is not the PICA board's business to tell the city of Philadelphia how many fire stations to have, what to negotiate in its labor contracts, to lay people off, to cut wages, to do anything. It is, our, it is our job to see that the City of Philadelphia has a balanced budget. And it is up to the City to develop a plan to eliminate the structural deficit, to project five years worth of balanced budgets, and then it is up to us to assess the reasonableness of those assumptions and the capacity of the City to deliver on its plan. It was so that you do not have a PICA board voting to contract out any services, or to have a contracting out program, or to negotiate a two-year wage freeze, so or to do any of those it things. It would have been almost 
sent the wrong message and be counterproductive to put the mayor on there. That, that would have said correct. this would have said the board has the authority as right. opposed to the mayor and council. That right. you had your role, they had theirs. That is the a very correct way to view that. That it would have been counterproductive, ineffective to have the mayor on the board. Okay. We, we need, we, and, and it seems to me that that is the difference, uh, Mr. Chairman, between a control board and an oversight board. Okay. I've got a bunch of questions before I yield to, uh, to Mrs. Norton. I just want to ask Mr. Cohen uh, just to get into an issue that I think the city is wrestling with now, and that the fiscal discipline doesn't mean no compassion at all, does it? In fact, sometimes it, if you could just talk about that, because you have impeccable credentials, all of you do, in terms of, of, uh, of being on the compassionate side of politics and understanding what that's all about, but at the same time recognizing you've got to have money to pay for it. That is absolutely the case, and I, I frankly, that's a great phrase. I'll have to remember that, pass it along to the mayor, because being fiscally responsible, balancing your budget, absolutely does not require that you be punitive with respect to anyone. And I think that probably one of the greatest parts of the Philadelphia success story um, is that is that uh, is that we have not been punitive to anyone. We have not we have not cut services anywhere. To be perfectly candid, um, we have not laid off a single person in three years as a result of, as a result of any of the five-year plans that we have developed. Even in our contracting out program, where we have essentially eliminated more than 800 union jobs within the city government as a result of that program, none of those people has been laid off. They have all been offered alternative employment within the city government um, at other vacant or available city jobs. Um, we have as I described, uh, the, the, the approach of this plan and of the initial plan of a, of a plan of a thousand paper cuts. And that's, I mean, there are lots of people that got nicked, but nobody, nobody had any gushing wounds as a result of what we've done. And even on the labor side, and I, the, I mean, the Mayor Rendell and I try and talk about this all the time because I think Mayor Rendell gets this sometimes um, almost horrific national reputation of how he beat the labor unions and how he how he how he how he how he how he, how he, bow, how he created this plan by by goring the labor unions and i will tell you that at the end of our contract at the end of our contract negotiations in 1992 um, municipal employees in the city of philadelphia first of all had their jobs as i said no layoffs in 3 years second of all no pay cuts there were no unpaid furlough days. There were no rollbacks in wages. Yes, there was a two-year wage freeze um, that was negotiated as part of that contract. But in April of 1992, our entire municipal workforce received an 8 percent pay increase. It was a backloaded pay increase at the end of their last contract. So then in April of 1992, everyone got 8 percent. Then they had to wait another two and a half years before they got their, before they were to receive their next pay increment. Because of our step system and non-merit pay based increases though in that two and a half year period 51 percent of the municipal workforce has received a raise Fifth, even though there's been a wage freeze 51 percent of the municipal workforce has received a raise and among those people who have received raises the average raise is about six percent which is which is higher than the rate of inflation over that period of time our workers ended up with, uh, with um, 10 paid holidays, with anywhere from 10 to, f to 20 paid vacation days, four personal leave days, a generous bereavement benefit, um, probably still one of the wealthiest and most luxurious pension plans um, in, the, in the city of Philadelphia. I've got to keep you quiet before my staff hears about this. Right. Deal. <laughs> fully paid, a fully paid health insurance with, um, under a managed care model, with fully paid dental, optical, and prescription benefits. No copay of premium for yourself or your family if you are in a managed care health plan. This is not a terribly burdensome or oppressive labor contract from the perspective of a benefit level that is being, that is being maintained in the city of Philadelphia today. Um, and that package that I've just described to you is saving the city of Philadelphia more than $100 million a year. It gives you a sense where we were beforehand. Um, and I think uh, the point that the chair makes is absolutely the case. You can be fiscally responsible, you can gain control of your fiscal destiny, and you can have compassion for your workforce and for your public and your citizens 
who are receiving the services that you are delivering. And in fact, the argument that we have made is that not making the difficult choices that we have made would have precisely the consequences that people fear. That is, if we did not negotiate changes in the, in the benefit structure of the plan, we would have had to lay people off. And we, would have had to, and we would have had to go to wage rollbacks or unpaid furlough days. We, ironically, would have created a worse situation for our workforce by not negotiating these concessions than we have achieved for them as a result of the negotiation of the concessions. And certainly from the perspective of the taxpayer, um, which is not facing uh, declines in services, but in fact three years after the fact is now experiencing a service level that surpasses that which was available to them before the fiscal crisis. Um, the, the, the fiscal sanity um, has meant your, their government doing more for them and not their government doing less for them. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass the baton here to Mrs. Norton, who I know has some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a kind of contrast that emerges here between uh, New York, which had to take these draconian uh, measures immediately just to, just to get some extra money and what happened in Philadelphia. Um, and as I try to search for what was the ingredient that led to the roster of, uh, of uh, benefits you described, um, you indicate that the uh, board didn't do this, the city did it. Um, in order in order to, it, it suggests that in order to be in that position uh, that you need city leadership that is willing to look for innovative alternatives pretty quick or else the notion of no layoffs uh, and um, indeed the opposite increases. Uh, becomes uh, hard to understand. S um, so a am I right in believing that, um, it, that uh, what made this possible was that the city leadership, the elected leaders hustled to find ways to get uh, changes uh, that would make for real dollars and eliminate the need for the ultimate remedies such as layoffs? That is, that is accurate, and I, I think I would support what Dr. Anderson said in his testimony, which is that the presence of the PICA board, as I said, cannot be, and the importance of that cannot be overstated, because what we had, I mean, what we had was, was this pile of unpaid bills. I mean, there were $200 million of unpaid bills. You could go and look at a computer printout of the bills that were not paid, and it made you sick to your stomach because you saw all those bills, but you also realize that you were on a very short string, that it, it, there is a limit to how long the telephone company is not going to be paid. Yes, it's the city of Philadelphia, but eventually, after eight months of not being paid or nine months of not being paid, they will eventually do what they would do to anyone well, else. Uh, uh, do you, you, you ha did you have an immediate infusion of, of, of uh, I think, no, we I had think to Dr. Do Anderson it. had testified that that's what they wanted right. but didn't get. Was what we had to do was we had to do, we had to negotiate the agreement and then we had to do a plan. And the plan had to specify exactly how we were going to eliminate that deficit. All those innovative ideas, all those creative ideas. Then the, control, then the PICA board would look at that plan and if they found our ideas reasonable and believed that we would proceed to implement it, then the PICA board was prepared and did issue uh, bonds in order to fund that I'm, deficit. I'm, I'm, to I'm trying to figure how but much. I, I think, yeah. uh, Ms. Norton, that I understand what you're driving at here with respect to the timing of this. And let me walk you through it. The PICA board came into office in June of 1991. At that time, the city was facing difficulty in paying its bills. There was a short-term note offering in August of 91, in which this, although the city did not have an investment uh, grade rating on its uh, securities, uh, they put together a private sector loan uh, uh, pro uh, transaction that was backed up by a number of banks, similar to what the District of Columbia did a month or so ago, as, as I recall it, when the former mayor was the, one of her last acts. 
then the city had enough to go through around uh, December. And the wolf was at the door again. They then sold, uh, what, a hundred and, what was that, a hundred and ten million dollars? or Small amount. A small, small amount, again, under one of these special financial transactions for which they paid uh, usurious yeah. uh, rates of interest. But that got them through around February or March when the uh, property tax revenue started to come in. What was happening is the city was sort of bouncing along, meeting its uh, uh, financial responsibilities, not paying the merchants. There were some merchants who were 60 to 90 de- uh, days behind payment. That went on. Th- that number of merchants was continuing to rise. But the point here is that nothing was done to reduce the structural deficit. The deficit was continuing to rise. They were not dealing with that. They were dealing with short-term cash needs. When, when Mayor Rendell came in, first of all, to, re- to respond to a part of your question, when Ed Rendell was running for mayor of Philadelphia, at that time, he came up with certain ideas that he wanted to implement when he got into office, if he won the election. So when he came in, very early in his term, we began discussions with him on the terms and conditions, the content of a five-year financial plan. We got the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement in place. He got to us in February of 92, his five-year plan. We approved that, then began immediately the process of structuring a bond offering, which we consummated in June of 1992 for 470, how much was that? $475 million. So the point here is that we did not extend funding early on. We insisted that these other mechanisms be in place because, in our view, that was the only basis on which we could assure that a plan would be in place to reduce the structural deficit. In the meantime, the city bounced along on its own accord, borrowing money at very high rates of interest, and did did nothing to reduce the structural deficit. If we had not borrowed by the end of the fiscal year, which was June 30, uh, the city would have missed a payroll if the pension fund or missed debt service. Or all three. All three. Some combination of all three. So it sounds like where the district is now. Well, the, 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 it's right. where, and, yeah. And it really was the hammer. Been worse yeah. right. It really was the hammer, if you will. We didn't have to implement everything to get access to the cash, and cash yeah. infusion. We had to have the plan yeah. that the board approved as being reasonable, mm-hmm. if implemented, that would have solved the structural done. deficit. And if you, lady, you, I just would say what you've done is you've reversed the internal politics of the city, that all of a sudden the politics are to come out and do these, make these decisions as opposed to not letting your employees get paid. That's correct. But also the point that, that you've asked before, Mr. Chairman, is, is absolutely the proper one. Do you have a board that is able to take the heat? You have to have a board that is prepared not to accept the plan that is prepared to have payless paydays, interest-less interest payment days, and pension-less pension payment days. You have to be willing to let the bus go over the cliff. It's, it's a very high-stakes game of chicken, but if that means that the government has to shut down as a way of giving a wake-up call to the people who are elected to do the job, that's what you have to do. Did, did you ever have to, did, did, did PICA ever have to withhold funds or threat to withhold funds in there order to? There was one variance in December of 1992 following the uh, labor negotiations. However, we understood that was coming in the sense that, that the city did not get all that it had tried to get at the negotiating table. So it was not a shock or a surprise, but it was a variance. Uh, finally, just let me uh, ask about your wage tax. Uh, we are always told that if, if there's a wage tax, then business moves out of the city, so, so it, it uh, is counterproductive. What's the experience with uh, Philadelphia well, with the wage tax? Th- there are many, th- there are many uh, Ms. Norton, views on that matter. I, I think the consensus is that the, the level of the uh, Philadelphia's 
wage tax is a disincentive to the location of businesses in the city. Now, bear in mind that the wage tax is assessed on people who live outside the city but work in the city as well. Uh, I don't think there's any question that the wage tax is a drain on economic growth in the city of Philadelphia. However, as an economist who has looked at this issue over a long period of time, it is my judgment that the city wage tax is not as great a disincentive for uh, economic growth in the city of Philadelphia as many other economists and, and some others uh, in the business community believe it is. But there's no question that if we could reduce that wage tax, it would have an incentive to keep some people in the city who otherwise have a significant incentive to move out. And I think it also would allow Philadelphia to retain uh, more of the businesses uh, that, are, that are there. Well, it has to have an extraordinary incentive effect to make up for 40 percent of your 40 48 percent of, of our revenues. But um, 48 percent of your revenues, I mean, I, I, Although, I, if I can, we are proposed um, in, in this five year plan that the mayor has just proposed, um, there is a 7 percent reduction in the wage tax proposed over the next five years. Um, and, and this plan, and that is on top of an 8 percent reduction in our business privilege tax over the same period of time. So that this, this plan actually includes a, over a five year period, a material reduction in two of the most difficult taxes for um, whether we could, we could quibble about the, the uh, size of the impact that they have on economic development in the city. I think everyone would agree that at their current levels they are two very, very difficult taxes. Um, every national survey that has been done in the past five years has concluded that Philadelphia's businesses are the most taxed businesses in the country and that ind Philadelphia's individual citizens are the most taxed individual citizens in the country. Um, so that the, the, the individual and business tax burden has become a disincentive to economic development and this plan does um, contain a plan for the first time, as I said, in 50 years to begin a long-term incremental strategy of reducing those taxes ever so slightly um, every year. And e every budget, sta every year, stays in balance even with those reductions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, all three of you for this very I useful testimony. Thank you. I just got two other brief uh, comments. First of all, to Mr. Cohen, you, you talked about the goal really is competition, not privatization, if you look to this second. Goal. And I think that's a, that's a good observation. So sometimes we get driven by wh whether you privatize or not. But we are really trying to bring competition to government. Correct. And privatization is a mechanism to do that. And sometimes the private sector wins out, but sometimes the public sector gets leaner and meaner. So Correct. And even we have found, um, our commissioners tell us that the impact of this program has perhaps been greatest in areas where we haven't even talked about privatizing any services yet. Because all of a sudden, the whole government says, and I'm, I'm not just talking about workers, I'm talking about managers too, who also run the risk of losing their jobs in a successful privatization that, hey, we better get our act together or we could be next on their list. And it, and it, it has really had a positive impact in the way people approach the thinking about how they should do their jobs um, and, how the, and how the business of government should be conducted. Okay. Finally, Mr. Henry, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Great testimony. As I look at when your admonition, really, I think you're telling us to look um, as we go through this process. We want to be at the end of this process before we get into the process. In other words, where do we want the end result to be? And you need to look at that in stepping back uh, instead of just setting up a process and seeing where it goes. We need to. That's look. correct. You're going to put some forces in play here that will reverberate up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. And each decision you make will foreclose some others at a later date. Uh, it's important, I think, as I believe uh, Ned Regan mentioned, to have an exit strategy to know how you get out of this. Uh, it's inappropriate to declare victory and leave. I think you have to have an orderly process both to get in, to run it, and get out of it so that you can uh, extricate yourself and leave behind uh, something of value. Thank you all very much. We appreciate you being here with us, sharing this, uh, sharing 
public record, but this is uh, this was I think outstanding. Uh, I think Ms. Norton will agree as we go into the record and uh, uh, work through a very difficult situation. But your testimony has helped tremendously in that regard. So thank, thank you for having thank me. You. Thank you. We'll be adjourned. We'll be adjourned. C-SPAN, a public service created by America's cable television companies. Here's a look at the program schedule for the next...